Let's start with this coronation, a practice that reflects biblical coronations. So you've got coronations of the likes of King Saul and King David and King Solomon, Old Testament coronations, and there's got a, there's some similarities here, aren't there? Yeah, there's some deep connections that um, deliberately, for, for more than a thousand years, have tied the uh, English coronation to um, the biblical events. So... Uh, for example, um, for since I think the at least the thirteenth century, at the very point of anointing the the monarch with oil, um, the passage is read from one Kings, where it says that Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet they uh, anointed King Solomon uh, with oil. So that is read at the same time. So the understanding of the um, the investiture, the appointment of the monarch is is definitely shaped by um, by the Bible. And even more than that, it's very interesting. Um, King Charles has arranged for the anointing oil that's going to be used for his anointing to be um, prepared, made in Jerusalem from olives from the Mount of Olives. <laughs> and uh, so it's actually oil from the very probably the very place uh where the oil came from for solomon's anointing uh so many thousands of years ago so that's a um a, clo a connection that is tying um this ceremony to the uh, ceremonies in jerusalem and, and also it's traditional at the start of the coronation service to sing psalm 122 i was glad when they said unto me we'll go into the house of the lord and it speaks about standing in the gates of jerusalem so it's as if it's as if the the, the anointing of the of the king in westminster abbey it's as if it's taking place in the temple in jerusalem as if it was solomon's anointing so yeah there's a very a very strong connection and that has been maintained for uh, more than a thousand years in in the coronation of the of the monarchs of england i mean who knows how mainstream secular media will be reporting on the pageantry of the coronation but in some sense here uh, won't be hidden on this program but we're talking about the biggest church service of the 21st century coming up, aren't we? This is something that is really a religious event. It's not something that somehow or other is disguised, is it, Mark? It's it's pretty significant. Yeah, it's very much, a, uh, it's actually a communion service. And it's um, the order of services under the responsibility of the Archbishop of Canterbury. And um, he has a uh, you know, very strong, clear say in how that's all put together. There are many other stakeholders as well, but he's definitely presiding at the service and, and leading the service. Um, and because it's a communion service, it includes the normal Anglican elements in a communion service. There is um, uh, prayers of confession. There's readings from the scripture. Uh, people will say the creed. There'll be um, the consecration prayers for communion. Um, there's blessing, uh, also the people present, um, there's the procession and the recession. So these are standard elements in a communion service. You mentioned, you know, will the secular media acknowledge or pick up on these elements? It's a very good question. I was reading Hello magazine and that lots of magazines, Vogue and others are, are have information about the coronation. It's a sort of big social event of the year. Uh, but it was really interesting that Hello Magazine completely ignores the Christian elements in the service. So it just it just mentions the things that are somehow relevant to what happens to the king, uh, but it doesn't mention communion, doesn't mention reading from scripture, it doesn't it doesn't really mention that this is a worship, a service of worship and prayer, and um, it has some very strong theological content that runs all the way through the service and that's absolutely clear and uh, it, it was you know we had a similar experience i think with the funeral service for queen elizabeth ii that this was a very very christian service and and this one will be this one will be as well interesting when you draw attention to the fact of the coronation being a communion service and when we use that communion and depending on what sort of Christian cultural background, uh, those listening to our conversation today come from, uh, they'll be thinking, oh, well, we do communion this way and they do communion that way. But 
there is something here that takes us right back to the Last Supper and what we read about in the Scriptures, uh, kingship in that context. How do you reflect on how the, the coronation uh, might reflect on the Last Supper and that really direct connection to Jesus the King? There's no doubt that this service, in a number of different ways, acknowledges the sovereignty of Jesus Christ and his centrality for law and order in the nations. Um, the orb that is given to King Charles has a cross on the top of it, and it's a symbol of the world and that Christ is Lord of all, of all the world. One of the secular sites says that it's a symbol that... Um, uh, that Jesus rules the Christian world. But no, that's not what it's a symbol of. It's a symbol that Jesus rules the whole world. And um, there are a number of elements uh, in the prayers, in the vows that are made that constantly reference the sovereignty of Christ. And um, it's very significant, I think, that the very first thing the monarch does after being invested and enthroned and you know receiving all that regalia, the very first thing the monarch does is take communion and, and kneel down and... So, I mean, what that means, the communion service means, is that it's a it's a participation in Christ, that life comes from being one with Jesus and sharing in his death and in his life. And so that is a very powerful symbol that uh, the king is, as the monarch of England and, and the other nations as well, is um, connected to and draws strength from the, the life of Christ. There are, there are other references to the, the life of Jesus throughout the service. For example, um, when um, in, in Queen Elizabeth's uh, service, when she was anointed, the prayers make reference to the anointing of Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit when he was baptized. And the prayer is just as Jesus was, um, the, the dove of the Holy Spirit came upon uh, Jesus, so may the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit, come upon um, the uh, the monarch as well. And interestingly, one of the scepters that's given to the monarch has a, a dove on the top and a, and a cross, so that this is a symbol of the receiving of the Holy Spirit for for office, which is the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So, yeah, this is an absolutely profoundly Christian service. One of the striking things about the service is that. Um, the king undertakes, as his mother did before him, to um, defend the faith, to 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 protect the God. The pro it's interesting. This was ceremony. Um, the, the the king, the queen, undertook to protect the proclamation or the 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 sharing of the gospel, uh, to uphold the laws of God and the profession of the gospel. Uh, which is really striking. I mean, that's a heavy burden to lay upon a monarch, a <laughs> yeah, serious uh, commitment that's made to be an advocate for the the, the profession of the gospel in England. And um, as I was reading that, I thought, well, actually, I think the Church of England is struggling in some ways <laughs> in, in professing the gospel. And you have this secularization happening and questions about whether um, the church should be established as part of the state. Uh, so this is a, an interesting backdrop to uh, to this ancient uh, ritual that, that dates back a thousand years. I think we'll come back to that because that is just so important, isn't it? Because uh, when we talk about Christ being Lord of the world, uh, you mentioned the orb and the cross, and you said the whole world, not just the Christian world, and Undoubtedly, there'll be commentators who'll interpret that in different ways. But when you actually say this is Christ, Lord of the whole world, that becomes confronting, doesn't it? And as you also were uh, are talking through some things here about how things might be perceived or uh, we might all be wondering whether there'll be some sort of watering down and we're aware that Charles might want to include some other dimensions in his coronation and whether he's got a choice to do that or not, I'm not sure. But uh, but this, this thought, it is confronting, isn't it, that Christ is Lord of the whole world and that's going to be proclaimed at the coronation? Yes, I think so. It's, um, it's a very strong claim and it's at the heart of the English monarchy and has been for a thousand years that the sovereignty... The sovereignty of the monarch uh, actually comes from the sovereignty of Christ. That it's that it's um, that it's Jesus. It's God who appoints um, 
appoints rulers. It's it's really interesting. Part of the ceremony, the um, the monarch is given a sword, and there's a quotation from Romans 13, which says that the this is a passage where Paul says that it's important to respect and honor the the emperor or the secular rulers because they are appointed by God to wield the sword for the common good, to punish evil and to protect what is right. Um, but it's very it's interesting that in giving that sword to the monarch, it's a ceremonial sword. Um, I don't think it's ever been used to hurt anybody. <laughs> um, in giving that sword to the monarch, uh, this, the, the, the words that he used are that um, sovereignty and rule comes from God and it's under God that and the, the, the whole validity of the English monarchy is built on this principle that that sovereignty comes from from God comes from the Lord Jesus and the the ruler the monarch the reason why you would pray God save the king or God save the queen is because the ruler is meant to rule on behalf of God or with the authority of God and that includes advancing the gospel it includes advancing the kingdom of God it doesn't just include the way the service has traditionally been put together it doesn't just include secular affairs it includes the whole deal of of um, upholding the law of god so yeah it's going to be really interesting to see how some of those elements are, are reflected in the new service this, the new service is much shorter than the old service so some things will need to go I think the arbiter of that traditional theology of the service will definitely be the Archbishop of Canterbury. So he'll uh, he'll be working with that. And, um, you, you've mentioned King Charles. He's um, he's previously said that he'd like to be defender of faiths, not just defender of the faith. I think in recent times, um, surrounding his mother's funeral and and you know t uh, taking on this this role, he's he's not. He's not been emphasizing that sort of perspective so much. He's really been um, taking on the role of being the head of the Church of England and and professing Christian faith. So that's come through more strongly in in recent times. So I'd be curious to know more about his own personal journey of faith and how he how he understands all that. He, certainly, his mother had a very very clear um, Christian faith. Um, it was interesting in in her in her coronation. Um, for the first time, a Bible was given to the to the monarch, as and and she undertook to to rule in accordance with the scriptures. Uh, it'll be interesting to see whether that presentation of of the Word of God continues in in Charles' ordination service as well. It was an innovation in the 1950s, so they might not continue it. Well, I want to invite listeners to join in our conversation. You might have your own contribution to make. You might have a question for our special guest. You might be thinking, really, I didn't think of the coronation as being a service that is a church service. Well, 1-800-316-316. You might have your own thoughts, a question, a comment, even a critique for the conversation. Our special guest is the Reverend Dr. Mark Jury, pastor academic, a writer on the connection between faith and culture. He is the founding director of the Institute for Spiritual Awareness. We're back with more after uh, this short break. 